você estiver. Até no exterior, transformamos sonhos em profissão, tecnologia em inovação. Saúde e segurança em bem-estar. Conhecimento no futuro, talento em liderança. Transformamos até a sociedade. Representamos e incentivamos indústrias, empresas e startups em tudo que elas precisarem, do setor A, B ou C e de qualquer tamanho. E para elas entregamos soluções únicas, integradas e personalizadas. Porque somos muitas e ao mesmo tempo uma só. Viva a transformação! Sua rotina é cheia de desafios e atribuições, mas você não precisa fazer tudo sozinho. Todo empresário precisa de apoio. Por isso, ele precisa de um lugar que entenda seus desafios, possua corpo técnico especializado e apresente soluções customizadas. A Firjan é este lugar. A gente pratica o associativismo de alto nível, garantindo a prestação de serviços de excelência e benefícios exclusivos para os associados. Reunimos empresas e indústrias de todos os tamanhos e setores em torno de um propósito comum. Juntos, conseguimos fortalecer ações para alcançar grandes objetivos. Juntos, buscamos as melhores soluções para um bem maior a todos. Juntos, somos mais fortes. Isso é associativismo. Com força e poder de mobilização, a Fijan atua de forma coletiva. Faz a sua voz ser ouvida nas esferas governamentais e contribui para o aumento da produtividade e crescimento dos negócios. Ao se tornar associado, sua empresa passa a ter acesso a soluções, benefícios e valores diferenciados, os serviços e produtos da Firjan Senai, Firjan SESI e Firjan IEL, além de uma rede de parceiros e convênios com vantagens exclusivas. Portanto, seja a sua empresa pequena, média ou grande, da indústria ou do encadeamento produtivo, a Firjan é para você, por meio dos nossos sindicatos e da Firjan CIRG. Para ter acesso a todas as vantagens é muito fácil. Basta acessar nosso site, preencher a ficha de pré-cadastro e aguardar o contato da nossa equipe. O lugar do empresário é na Firjan. Conte com a nossa parceria estratégica. Conheça todas as vantagens de se associar em firjan.com.br barra associe-se. Juntos, somos mais fortes. Seja associado! Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We are starting another series of talks to talk about some of the trends that's impacting people and, and companies. We're talking about new behaviors, new technologies, new business models, and what you can do today to be ever more prepared for the future. And if this system interests you, you can follow our podcast that we launched this year to talk more about all of these systems where we bring professionals from the marketplace and players that are creating many different options within their own segments. In a recent episode, Andres Blazodak, who's transforming uh, apartments into NFTs to facilitate real estate sales, uh, things like this, all of this you can check in your podcast app. Uh, the link will be available on YouTube so you can follow it and you can check our contents over there. And also follow us on Instagram slash Casa Firja, where we always have our schedule. And talking about the Casa Firja Aquarium, on the 5th of July, we have a panel regarding taking care of mental health and psychological care at companies. And we will have the first on-site event since the beginning of the pandemic. So we will bring Siddhartha Ribeiro, which is a great Brazilian neuroscientist, to do a presentation about his new book, which is The Manifest Dream uh, regarding apocalyptic 
uh, issues. So please follow this to to know what's happening at Fisher. So just follow us on Instagram or access our content platform at www.casafisher.com.br. I can see that there are some people already making comments. So I'd like to thank everyone for their presence. This is what's so cool about people who are watching this event live. They can ask questions, they can co make comments, they can interact. And obviously we'll, we'll try to uh, bring these questions to our presentation today. So go ahead and ask questions. Feel free to interact because this is all very cool. And of course, the event will remain recorded on YouTube. So if you want to watch it later, or if you want to share this with others who might be interested, go ahead and do it. I can already see here Natalia, Jorge, Oscar, Elena, Carlos, Bianca. Thank you very much for your participation in the chat room. So go ahead and ask questions. And without further ado, our talk today is the ESG guide for forward-looking leaders. I think we have a lot of great content here for us to talk about. And the person who will be presenting this today is Terence Lyons, the founder and CEO of the stakeholder company, TSC. Together with him, we will have the participation of Gabriela Burian, who is a global leader of a multi-stakeholder platform at Bayer. And Carol, Carolina Zoclio will be mediating this, this meeting. She's a specialist in sustainability at FISA. So without much further ado, I'd like to thank everyone for their presence. Terence, thank you very much. Gabriela, thank you also for participating. And uh, Carol, now I'll give you the floor to mediate uh, the session. Good morning, everyone. Good morning for those of you who are in Brazil. Good evening for those of you who are in Singapore, such as our colleague Terence. It's a pleasure to be here with you to, con to be conducting this debate about such a relevant topic for our companies here in the state of Rio de Janeiro and for Brazilian companies. I don't need to say how much ESG has become such an important theme for our business sector. This is not the first or last event that will be uh, have this guiding theme. This is a trend. This is a topic that has already been consolidated. It's already in our business leaders' heads. But just like anything that's new, just like anything that's becoming consolidated in the business sphere, uh, people ha still have a lot of questions about what, which path to, uh, to take, where to start, where capacities should be developed in terms of leadership and the, and the capacity of our team, the capacity of the institution, and how I can internalize this idea in my business. So it's about these challenges that we'll be talking about today. We'll have a different event from what we what we usually have. We will try to have here a little bit of bilingualism, trying to do this transition from Portuguese to English and from English to Portuguese. Uh, so please be patient with us. Uh, we're doing our best to make this work. And without further ado, let's go ahead and start. We're English now because our first guest is Terence Lyons, the is founder and CEO of the stakeholder company that is a global leader uh, using artificial intelligence and big data for developing softwares and data related to ESG. And uh, TSC uh, has been doing uh, research in a lot of uh, countries around the ESG with the uh, intention to comprehend the greatest challenges the, uh, of this uh, uh, topic around the world including Brazil. So that's why Terence is here and he's going to share with us uh, a little bit of uh, his great experience. Uh, Terence, I'm, I'm going to just introduce uh, a little bit about you just for people to know because I don't know how much you're going to speak about yourself, but I would like to, uh, to, to say that, uh, first of all, Terence is based in Singapore, um, but he has a uh, extensive great experience um, ar ar around sustainability and data, which is very interesting because uh, ESG sustainability depends a lot on data for us to develop uh, better public policies, strategies, and, uh, and to be uh, very uh, to the point on what companies need to do about it. So Terence has 17 years of experience in corporate communication and public affairs, working across Asia, Europe, and the US. He 
previously headed Microsoft's global stakeholder enga engagement strategy, and he has worked with many of Fortune 500 companies such as ExxonMobil, Nokia, HP, HP in Portuguese, to help them better manage their reputation and stakeholder engagement programs. And there's a lot we, we have to say about ESG and stakeholder engagement. So please, Terence, be very welcome. The floor is yours. Let's debate this very interesting topic. Obrigado, Carol. And um, a bon dia to everyone. And I, and particularly our co-author, Gabriela, it's lovely to see you again. I, I do have to apologize, everyone, because since I was last in Rio before the lockdown, my Portuguese just hasn't improved at all. So I do apologize that we have to speak in English. So very sorry about that. But I've always enjoyed the uh, uh, Fersian events. In fact, um, I, I was there just before the lockdown for a wonderful, a wonderful session on innovation. And I, I, I was privileged to have a tour in your lab. And there were so many robots and drones and fun things to play with. I just wish I had had more time. But yep, today we're going to talk about ESG. It's pretty important. And particularly in, in Gabriella's field in, in agriculture, it's even more important. We know what's happening around the world in the Ukraine. But I, I just did some reading yesterday and I found it very, very interesting to see that a nation of 40 million people in the Ukraine feeds directly 400 million people. And that's directly. And there's all the indirect uh, consequences of what's happening. So we do live in a, in a in a very difficult time for the human species. It's almost we have ups and we have downs, and it seems like we're in one of those downs. My belief is that that ESG will play a fundamental part in helping us as a human species actually survive the next decade, and the next decade, and the next decade after that. So I think there's nothing more important than and we could be focusing on right now. And that's why TSC over the last three years has turned everything we do towards sustainability and sustainability systems. It's for my children, it's for all of your children, it's for ourselves, it's so important. So today I'd like to share just a few ideas, a few thoughts. And the purpose is really to let you know how far we have come analyzing ESG across the world. I share with you open questions which we still don't have answers for yet. Maybe you do, and I'd love to hear that in the chat. But without further ado, I'll go ahead and share that. So Carol was uh, kind enough to introduce us, so thank you for that. Um, we're, we're actually today one of the global leaders in ESG, and we work with lots of diverse companies around the world. But what we realized is that that's, that's interesting, but there are some very big questions. Now, what we discovered at the start of these tours that we did across the globe is that the fastest thing on the planet is no longer the speed of light. It's people becoming or calling themselves ESG experts. And some of the data on the right shows that we have a 75% rise in media coverage over the last year. We have 40% salary increase for people with ESG expertise. And we have examples like PwC who are investing $12 billion in creating 100,000 ESG jobs. It's amazing. It is the future. And one thing we, we, we look at with great interest, given the size of our team in Latin, is the Latin, Latin American context. So where are we in Latin America? And this is a very high level summary. So if you disagree, I would love to hear from you. But what we see is that the demand from Latin American investors is actually one of the highest globally. So we have 64% um, who consider it a priority as against 56% in the rest of the, the, the globe. And that's really a focus on the notion that companies with a higher integrity outperform their peers. 
We also see that the motivation, the number one motivation is the value system. Now, I've spent some time in Latin America, in beautiful Brazil, right down to Argentina and up to Mexico and pretty much everywhere in between. And one thing I always felt about uh, Latin America is the strong sense of values that people have. And in fact, this, this shows that in a chart where 59% consider their investment strategies need to align with their organizational principles. We also see that while strong ESG performance leads to better returns, and on the left chart, we can see that the MSCI ESG Leaders Index consistently outperforms those not on it. We also see on the right that ESG frameworks in Latin America are developing. Reporting is largely still voluntary and it's developing. So we see that in Mexico, Argentina, in Brazil, and we see that a lot of the government-based regulations are often reactive, not proactive. And that's been very interesting looking at Latin American companies because they've largely taken on the job of driving this forward themselves, even though the government is not pushing them to. Fascinating stuff. But what we did is we, we, we stepped back a few years ago and we said, okay, it's time to get really smart on ESG. So I personally read thousands of articles on ESG from academics, from business, from investors. And the strange thing is, the more I read, the less I knew. I would get repetition. I would get incorrect uh, statistics, uh, incorrect statement. I would get largely feel good notions of we need to do this because it's good for the planet. But none of what I read really, really led me to understand okay, so if we do need to focus on ESG, how? How do we do it? Give me a guidebook, give me a playbook. And so we set out to write that. Now, the first playbook that we wrote. Uh, was the, called the ESG playbook. It's a higher level series of models designed to, to guide everything from amateurs in ESG right through to experts. And actually recently with Gabriella with, and working with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, we've actually been able to develop a, a roadmap to ESG leadership. So super important stuff. So please, if you are interested in that, go ahead and download it. Load it. It's completely uh, open to the public, and we'd welcome your thoughts after that. So they're the playbooks, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight, this morning, sorry. Typically, we see five common needs in organizations. One is that they need to have a shared understanding of ESG. The next is they want to keep pace with this rapidly changing ecosystem. The third is how do I do it? What are the steps I need to take to have a strong outperforming ESG workflow and process? Four was the notion of this subject of materiality, and we'll come back to that. Materiality in ESG basically means what matters to you, the company, and what matters to you, your stakeholders? Things like climate change or uh, greenhouse emissions. How important is that to you compared to your stakeholder groups? And so the notion of stakeholder mapping becomes very, very, very important. And so that's the point five. So I know that seems like a lot to get to, but I promise to be as brief and as brilliant as I possibly can, or at least I'll, I'll be brief. So the first need was to understand ESG. And really, there's a lot of data on the right. Don't really focus on that. But focus on the notion that ESG is simply a set of forces. There are investor forces. There are consumer forces, employee and staff forces. That's attraction and motivation. It is becoming government requirements. It reduces your risk from litigation volatility. 
But quite simply, many of the people that I talked to in Latin America when we were doing this just simply said, Mate, Terence, Terence, it's obvious. It's just good for business and it's good business practice. The next need was to keep pace with the ESG ecosystem. And this picture is truly awful. It's a horrible picture. That's a picture of the ESG ecosystem. Everything from the disclosure standards to the frameworks, to the benchmarks, to the alliances, to the frameworks, and to the resources, credit rating agencies. It's very, very, very complex. And if we look at what happens to standards at the bottom, this is truly an acronym soup. We have, we start off with a few uh, ISO, et cetera. Uh, WBC, CSD comes into play in 1995. Then we have the CDSB, and then we have the TCFD, and then we have the SASB, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just keeping track of all of that development in the ESG ecosystem is a full-time job in itself. So what the, the next thing that clients consistently said and, and people that we interviewed was, what, what do we do? What is the workflow? And so over the course of that paper, we define six key steps. So one, we have to define our purpose. Then we have to figure out the reporting framework that we're going to be focused on. We need to do this materiality assessment, which is to ask what, what matters to you all, please tell us. Third, we need to engage the stakeholders to prove that. Then we need to gather all of this data. And data is truly myriad and complex in the ESG ecosystem. Then we need to report it. And then we need to cross-check. We need to monitor what's happening and are we picking up any controversy in our in our business? Now, the hardest things that we found were step two, materiality assessment, step three, stakeholder engagement, and step six, controversy monitoring. So we'll show you a little bit what that looks like in a moment. Now, the next the next point, the next need was essentially to have a God's eye view of materiality. So as a CEO, as a sustainability team, as an ESG leader, I need to look at my whole region or my country or my planet and understand what's happening dynamically, almost in real time. What's happening, who's making it happen, and how can we influence it as a company? And that's why we call it God's side. It's actually quite complex, but you need to be able to simplify this thing so that anyone can do it. And finally, when you have been able to figure out what, what is what matters, what's material, then the notion of better stakeholder engagement. Now we know that ESG and sustainability and green is a competitive space. I'm going to say that my company is green, but my next competitor is saying, Oh, no, 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 we're, we're shiny green. And then the next competitor is going to say, oh, no, 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 we are super shiny Teflon uh, green. In the end, no one believes it. We need the proof points. It's not just a message, but it is a battle. It's becoming a battle. So increasingly, when we look at themes like plastics, this looks complex, it's really not. We just see that there are 52 global plastics initiatives. But when we look at ocean cleanup, we see that that in itself is a dense network of governments, of NGOs, of producers, of academia. It's complex, but it doesn't need to be impossible to do. So what I'll do is I'll stop sharing uh, there and I'll actually take you to a, a, a demonstration system which we've been working on since the tour with uh, since the global tour with Gabriella and writing this book said what we have up here matters it really matters how much we care about this topic but unless we can scale ourselves it doesn't really matter we're always going to be caught out by surprise our competitors are always going to be doing something different 
are they doing the right thing or are we doing the wrong thing? Who knows? So we need to be able to test this dynamically. And so after that playbook, we stepped back and we took a bunch of data scientists into the lab and we locked the door. And then we would put food underneath the door to make sure that they were okay. And we said, only come out when you can build that. And so I'll show you a sneak peek of what they've been building. And if it breaks, we will blame the data scientists. So this is my God's eye view of the world. I'm a sustainability pr uh, uh, practitioner, or I'm the head of ESG for a global bank or an agriculture company. But I want to look across my world and say, hmm, what's happening? And then I want to be able to drill down into different uh, countries like Brazil and see what's happening on the core topics that concern us. And then I want to go even to a lower detail and saying what matters to NGOs, to governments, to politicians, to, to consumers in Rio around agriculture. And so we start to see that there are a lot of things that are trending positively, but a lot that are not. And that these issues are emerging and these issues are trending. So now we start to get a sense of, okay, what's happening? What's happening in Rio compared to, compared to Central District? And we start to get a shape of things. But then what we need to do is rapidly understand who's behind it, all these, these topics. So the stakeholder view who are driving this debate and what are they saying? And so here we're bringing up uh, different content from many, many, many sources scraping about 10 million sources for this particular window every every uh, month and putting it into a dashboard and once we once we've determined that yes indeed the mayor of rio is very 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 important for this debate the next task is actually to look at our friend the mayor and what we want to see is what matters to him and what's being said about him over time. So we see various topics and yellow is not so good, but it's not so bad. Uh, but we see he's trending different ways on different uh, things. And then we can drill down into what's being said about him or what he's saying. So we want to be able to do this live after we've understood who he is and then how he's connected and once we start to do that, we get a sense of, of who our friend the mayor is and how he might connect to social networks. Because it's not just uh, old fashioned um, a meeting and greeting that matters these days. It's the power of the World Wide Web and how we can connect. And so here we can start to see who he's followed by, who he's following and who are mutual pathways. We might say, yes, Eduardo is key for us on ESG because he truly believes in our program, but he doesn't want to talk to us. Then we need to understand, okay, if that's the case, then who might surround our friend Eduardo and how can we actually map who these different organizations are and how they're connected to many others? And we can add these to the, 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 the map and it starts identifying that indeed our friend here is connected to this entity and this entity. So that's a very, very, very simple uh, and maybe boring um, uh, overview. But I'll tell you what I am interested in is ra mapping Russian oligarchs. And I became interested in mapping Russian oligarchs when I started to read the BBC and I could no longer figure out in my head who was connected to who, who had the biggest yacht, who knew Vladimir Putin. And so I turned on the system and started to ask, how does our friend, or not our friend, Vladimir Putin, connect to the Ukraine? So we can see he's the godfather of the daughter of Oksana, who's married to Victor, who's a member of the opposition party. 
that in fact the most connected people on this map are Andrew So who is Andrew Lee and how do we start connecting to him? So there's two questions. What's happening? Who's making it happen? And on the what's happening question, I mentioned that ESG and green credentials and sustainability is a competitive game. And so what's increasingly important is to align ourselves to the greater community, to stakeholders. It's the notion of stakeholder capitalism. And so what this particular page that I'm on does is it looks and in real time on various critical topics and starts to say, well, if I look at carbon neutrality, how are different competitors trending? JBS is not trending very well on the circular economy. Why? On climate action, uh, let's click over here, uh, Nestle is actually tre uh, trending much better with than ABF or the Coca-Cola company. And so I'll, I'll stop sharing there, but the, the notion ultimately is that the power of data and the power of data science can increasingly help us in these very difficult debates, this very difficult interconnected world, and we can start to map global planetary level data to understand how things connect together, people connect together, so that we can drive better sustainability and ESG campaigns. And so just to, to finish, because I'm mindful of time, Carol, I hope I haven't uh, spoken too long. So just to, to uh, finish up, much, much, much appreciate being back at Fersia and I love being with you guys. If those playbooks can help you, please download them. It would be a pleasure to hear your feedback. And also please connect with me on LinkedIn and you can request a workshop. I'd love to share with you in more detail what we, we do. But the most exciting part of today's event is actually Gabriella now, who's going to be talking about Bayer's program because Bayer is truly driving a global change. That's a planetary level game changer. Because when you, when you think that food prices have increased 37% over 22, over this year, 37% and 25% last year. We are on the cusp, on the edge of a global crisis of food insecurity. And it's only companies like Bayer who will help us manage that. So I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you very much, Teres. Um, there are a lot of insights here that we are going to talk about in a few minutes. It's a very interesting uh, tool because uh, as I I could see, uh, we change from, uh, we change materiality from what we think our connections and our stakeholders are dealing with to what they are really dealing with. It's like we are we are digging from reality what is going on, what is in the thoughts of the leaders of our connections, our other organizations, other companies, and we can work uh, together uh, with uh, organizations we choose to uh, we select first, for example, and uh, we. We, we become able to um, to work into things that are really happening and not just what we are uh, perceiving or realizing or our um, our perception of what is happening. And this is seems to be, be very important when we are dealing with uh, ESG and with um, trend topics, trend uh, challenge of the world. Uh, we are um into so we are going to turn back to portuguese so i will give a few seconds to terence again so he can change his connection there <laughs> because gabriela um speaks portuguese so she will be able to uh, to to speak portuguese with us which is cool uh gabriela bem-vinda gabriela bem 
It's a great pleasure to have you here in this panel and to bring by that is a company that in Brazil and Rio de Janeiro doesn't need to be introduced. Uh, we have a uh, very great performance in Bayern in Brazil and Rio de Janeiro and Bayer didn't participate only in the initiative of ESG, but also participated also in our working group that we developed here in Fijan last year and the previous year in ESG. And the local and corporate leaderships in Brazil were very engaged in this movement. So it's an excellent choice. And I thank you very much for having having availability here. Although you're not uh, located here in Brazil, although you're also abroad, with a different uh, timetable here from us. Gabriela, let's uh, continue with what Terence mentioned, that she, he spoke about a very comprehensive approach about artificial intelligence and about the data. What can data do to facilitate this uh, follow-up of how we understand ourselves in that network of connections under any subject, but ESG is very important. And also, Gabriela has a strategic uh, position by it that is focused in multi-stakeholders engagement. So if you can bring you, us your in a view on this, it's going to be very interesting because many companies are migrating in this concept of the participation based on production and value chain to a more comprehensive uh, view of uh, connection network and value network. And as Terence very well mentioned, we have a great challenge, social challenge, that is uh, food safety and also uh, struggle uh, against uh, the mind. So everybody that is uh, following this in Brazil, this has been mentioned very strongly as a requirement that always existed, but is still more evident here in our reality. And we really, do have to do something and struggle against this. So, Gabriela, I pass the floor to you, and thank you very much. Let's hear her, and then we'll have a debate, a collective debate. We already have questions from the audience. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Fijan. Thank you to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I left Rio de Janeiro, but Rio de Janeiro continues with me. Now I live in Missouri in the United States but I always go back. My mother is very, uh, she acts a lot in Rio de Janeiro and we follow all the challenges that our country faces and always knowing about the opportunities that we also have in leading and mainly in the agriculture and uh, food in a very challenging moment for humanity. Uh, Terence mentioned here very well, uh, Ukraine, we cannot start anything currently without having some time to think about this. So today we're uh, having, we're reaching four months of war with Ukraine, 120 days in 2022, an uh, unexpected war. We from Bayer, we have a very important presence there. It's a Brazilian person that is leading Ukraine in Bayer, in Ukraine. And we are following very closely by it in Germany, for example, where we used to have discussions with shareholders two months ago, they were receiving the refugees. So we had a hybrid connection as all the security is being done. And we are having a very great support and we're sending seeds and uh, uh, medical drugs to the region. And Ukraine, as Terence has mentioned, Ukraine and Russia, this region, they're responsible for 30% of uh, wheat in the world. So, and um, above all, if we think about this can cover the challenge and some regions that are uh, poor regions that are more uh, very, uh, fragile, from the food point of view, they depend a lot. Lebanon, for example, 60%, they require this. So the challenge is very huge. And with COVID, we already had had this increase. The report, of, as you had shown this reality in a very impacting way, and it had an increase in food 
safety because of COVID in 2019-2020. And uh, this, unfortunately, is being considered a greater challenge now with the war. So it's our responsibility to be present and, yes, to maintain this issue of this very good assessment, a daily assessment. And that's why the requirement of this chat we're holding now and of tools that we're talking about. So I will share my screen, Carolina. You can tell me if you can see this okay. So yes, full screen, perfect, perfect. So, but as Carolina has mentioned, we have a huge presence here in Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro is our home also, besides other places and we're very happy to be here with you for this moment to think jointly how can we face all the challenges and besides that we have an area of vitamins and uh, aspirin also besides the medical approach and we have an area where we'll focus more that is agriculture that is where I find myself I came to the United States 10 years ago to uh, be part of stakeholder engagement this subject is my life and I think this is something that naturally we do in Brazil. The stakeholder engagement in Brazil is many times is our life because or we uh, participate or we don't survive. So when we talk about ESG, I think that it's not only a competition, but it's also survival for each of us, for the corporations, and for the society and this planet. Just thinking about all the challenges we're thinking about is fundamental for us to see as fundamental to have a guideline to where are we going towards. For us, in bar, it's very important health for all of us and uh, for mine, for no one. And that is what is guiding us. And to understand also that the business in the business area, the corporations in general can truly be part of the solution. It's a challenge. And in fact, we have to understand all the metrics and data are very important and the and daily dialogue dialogue with the stakeholders, but we can help and we, we are fundamental in the advance for a society to have this, the SDGs or the ODS, as we say in Brazil. So it's very important, this. And we're talking about metrics. I like to talk about governance because we cannot have a nice metrics, a nice vision, if we don't have a good governance, well-structured and very clear. We understand this. And to build transparency and to be sure that we are really going towards the correct uh, direction is fundamental. And a good governance is the base of any business that is in a dialogue scientifically with data and contact with the society. We have a lot of pride because our sustainability uh, guide is Governor Bayer. He is directly connected beside this. The board oversee about sustainability. Something that is fundamental is that we have uh, an advice. Uh, we have a council, of uh, external council that deals with sustainability that directs how we have to work. And we have a Brazilian, a well, very well known from many people that work, Brother Gias is part of our external council in sustainability, besides other important names and experts as Braulio in their fields. So he's on the Sustainability Council, which directs Bear, and he also issues reports, which you can find on the internet. And this report talks about what should be done. And there's a, a significant part that I like to call people's attention to, which is that part of the salary of these people is linked to our sustainability metrics. So every one of these aspects in ESG, that is in the environmental aspect, social aspect, or governance aspect, all of this, these different factors impact the salaries of our executives. So this is fundamental because without this, it's useless for a company to have goals. Sure, goals are important. That may be a first step, but we really need to advance in this integra integration aspect. 
And my area deals with strategy. So sustainability for us is directly linked to the company strategy. So we follow the principles which are very clear and which are reported in a transparent fashion for our stakeholder engagement. And so for this, we need tools that can guide our activities and that may report how our process is done. And of course, we're part of all of the different groups uh, that, uh, that have already been mentioned. Now, the integration of sustainability into business is important. And for that, we need to have value because we're in a market economy. So that's why we still need that's why we still need to be able to integrate values uh, with our strategies. Now, something which is fundamental is the carbon price. Companies will continue emitting carbon, so we need to work on pricing carbon. We need to understand what the price is. We need to understand how to incorporate this into our economy. And at Bayer, we do have an internal price on carbon, and it's 100 euros per metric ton which is quite significant. And this impacts all, all of the decisions, all of our business decisions. We don't make any decision without taking into account the price of carbon, which could be issued or not, which could be emitted or not in each one of our businesses. So this is fundamental for us. And in terms of metrics, because we talked about governance, but let's talk a little bit about metrics, both environmental and social metrics. In terms of metrics, we follow the Paris Accords. We all have to remember that we cannot, as human beings, as societies, as businesses, we cannot survive, we cannot be successful if we don't take responsibility for these changes that need to be done. So we're working very hard in all of our businesses to, uh, to, tr to transform a transformation that includes everything so that we can be carbon neutral in all of our scopes in 2050. And, and we also have um, mid milestones. So before we get into 2030, in 2029, we need to be at around 50% uh, a 50 reduction. So for 2030, we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30%. And in terms of environmental impact, which is the reduction of the impact of our chemical products, we also have a goal of 30%. And now we're migrating uh, from products to solutions because we understand that we can't work with the delivery of products uh, without having the idea of the whole. So we have to really work with this idea of the ecosystem. We have to work with farmers as well. The challenge belongs to all of us so that we can be successful and produce more using less. So from the social perspective, we have what we call 100, uh, we have 100 million small smallholder farmers. That's what we want to have by 2030 in low and medium income countries. So obviously this is not a focus for all countries. This is basically focused on the Southern hemisphere. This is something that we want to have to meet the demands of the agricultural sector. And obviously these people need special tools to be specific uh, tools, especially, for example, even the, the, the seed package needs to be different. So we're already halfway through the first goal. Um, and we have some other goals uh, related to consumer health and medicine. So we have the goal of meeting demands of 100 million women in the same region. We want to give the access to contraceptives to these people. And we want to give access to self-care to these women as well. And obviously we have to talk about gender parity. So that's one of our goals. That's one of our goals in all levels of the company. And there are other goals as well related to Latinos, et cetera. So we've been working very hard on that. And I'm very proud uh, to say that the leader of Bear in Brazil is a woman and she's a agronomist. She's, she's the, uh, we're the only company that has a female leader that came from the field. So we really are delivering these results. And so what we're doing is we're ensuring that diversified talents have space in our company. 
and that they're able to enact the changes that are necessary for our business and our society. So in terms of goals, we talked a little bit about this already, but I just wanted to bring this information here to show you how we're linking all of this to our business. These goals are not the foundation's goals. The FAIR Foundation has its own goals, but here what we have is basically business goals. So all of our solutions go through all of these goals. Our solutions need to deliver a reduction of CO2, and they need to have a smaller environmental impact. And we also want to impact smallholder farmers. So on the right-hand side, you can see a lot of our solutions. Some of them are products, other ones are related to data. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that, the creation of data, because that's something that we've focused a lot of that, on that. So our tripod is sustainability, innovation, and digital transformation. And digital transformation is part of our tripod because we believe that that's the only way that we can actually deal with every single part of the planet or, or the part of all the different parts that need to, uh, to be producing with the least amount of uh, raw materials possible. So how do we transform agriculture? Well, we do it with innovation. There's no other way. Only innovation can change agriculture. So we are investing a lot of money in this area. Just for you guys to have an idea, internally, our focus is to perform and transform. So we're working with paradigm shifts so that people can rethink the, the business, the businesses as a whole. And the carbon initiative in Brazil is significant. Both Brazil and the United States have an important role in this aspect. We're also working with low carbon agriculture together with farmers so that they can be a part of these solutions so that and we, they do this by incorporating carbon by means of less tillage by means of different techniques and and by using different products which may help to sequester carbon so today we have with this project 1.5 million acres and we're And just to conclude, basically, we really see, or we want to integrate all of those global challenges. This is what Terence and, and Caroline have been talking about. We have all of these global challenges. We have a lot of different challenges, different points, such as war and COVID, and all of these issues will become more prevalent. Uh, the population is growing and that presents us with more challenges. So what are our priorities so that we can ensure that our vision of health for all and hunger for none uh, can be achieved? That's important. Another issue is a better use of resources. So for example, uh, there's water, right? Uh, I'm using the color blue, the color blue here because it's linked to one of the uh, Millennium Development Goals related to better water use. And I know that in, in Rio, there's a focus on water quality. And basically in the next 30 years, we want to increase in 60, we want to increase production by 60%. And you know, this won't work out if we don't have transformation. So we're working very strongly with water and new products and new solutions. And again, we're working on low carbon agriculture. There's no other way. We can't have agriculture if it's not a low car low carbon agriculture. So this is what we're focusing on, so as to bring uh, an innovation uh, to, uh, to make this kind of agriculture available to everyone. So thank you very much, Carolina. Uh, over to you, Gabriela. Thank you very much for your very broad vision. It's really very challenging. Now, our debate. So, Terence, please rearrange. That's okay. That's good. So, um, okay, a few questions are coming. And we, I, I already had some questions, some topics to, to debate with you. So, we have around 30 minutes to do that. It won't be uh, enough, but uh, I'm sure we can go, go through uh, some um, main points um 
to our audience that is uh, probably uh, mostly uh, people that work in the industries and uh, in companies in Brazil. Not only leaders, but also staff, because um, as I can see, there's also staff here. Okay, so I think the first, the first, um, the first topic that I would like to bring is around materiality, because you both brought that, uh, um, of course, uh, the organizations are having to are facing the challenge to deal to relate differently with other organization, other companies and people and the society. Uh, and uh, the TSC um, uh, reports brought uh, an interesting concept of uh, dynamic material materiality. So uh, it's not enough just to check out what is material to our uh, business, but we need to be always rechecking uh, in, a, in a time scale that I would like you to speak about it. How is that? How, we, how companies, and please, if you could uh, think about all, also medium and small businesses that um, maybe doesn't have the tools, the complex tools that the uh, bigger companies have, how to update ourselves around the organizations and, uh, and the topics and the issues we need to be uh, introducing in our uh, core business. So Terry's first, please, and, the, and then Gabriela. Well, the, the, the notion of materiality has always been a challenging one. So uh, it lacked definition. There were different definitions in different organizations, different standards applied, uh, different uh, examples of materiality and what's relevant. So if you do a cross-basket comparison, TCFD, DSSD to others, uh, GRI, you will see a lot of different definitions of materiality. And so it's very, very challenging because a company as big as Bayer will need um, to, to, to study and to monitor 20 or 30 plus different standards just to make sure that if those analysts come knocking, they're ready to report. What a nightmare. I mean, in the, uh, at the end, Bayer is focused on the core set of, um, uh, of, of material factors which it believes it can drive most change in the world, most positive change. So if then they're approached um, uh, by another analyst asking for a different metric, they might not have it because they're not focused on it. it it's very, very challenging. But materiality has always been difficult. Uh, typically what we found during the writing of the book is that it's done every year or every two years. There's not a very regular refresh. So I would defy you to show me a company that had global pandemic meltdown as a material indicator in January of 2020. So we have to be far more dynamic, but materiality then became double materiality and now it's dynamic materiality. We actually, whilst most of the, the, the participants in the writing of the book with Gabriela agreed that, yes, we should do it more often, um, they, all considered that it was almost impossible. It was too expensive. It slowed the whole company down because you need multiple levels of management to approve. And whilst they're approving that, they're not running their ESG program. They're designing the materiality. And so it's, it's hence the, the notion of using AI tools, artificial intelligence, to be able to uh, monitor on a planetary level scale and then be able to drill down into a state or local scale to say what matters. What matters to different categories of stakeholders, governments or NGOs or international government organizations or trade unions or uh, activist groups. Actor, activist groups can be an amazingly good source to learn why you might not be aligned to stakeholders. And yet often we've found that companies won't go and talk to the activists because the activists don't like them. 
and they don't like the activists. And so it's this constant battle between them where uh, it's like the monkey. I see no evil, I hear no evil, I speak no evil. Um, I'd rather not talk to those activists. So if we can use systems, big technology systems, to mine all of that data and uh, test stakeholder perceptions, not on a sample size of two or 300, but on a sample size of 10 to 20,000, we will get a far more accurate, or well, that's always the hope, a far more accurate representation of what really matters. But, but, but you know, one comment I'll just make at the start. I said that um, sustainability was a competitive space. I want to be greener than my competition. But competition can also be good in this space. Because if Bayer uh, achieves excellence in one particular aspect, that's wonderful because everyone is going to copy them. And so what, what you see here in this very, very competitive agriculture space is Gabriela and Bayer gave long periods of time to writing this playbook so that their competitors could learn faster. Why would they do that? Because ultimately, this competition will drive us to a better place. And we all win, not just one company. But Gabriella, I'm sorry, I talked too long. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, uh, always good. I love to hear you, Terence, and always good. Uh, uh, totally agree. Uh, and in fact, it's, uh, I must say that uh, we, among uh, our group, uh, our friends are many times in sustainability areas of competitive companies. Then mm. uh, what I totally can say is they are not my competitors. They are my friends. Uh, the competition is on the ground with our solutions. And uh, in order to be ahead of the competition on the ground with solutions, this part needs to be the best in class. Then we need to always be transforming. Then the real uh, differential the in the power of transformation, right? And it's how we can use uh, the information faster. Then back to the question that uh, Carolina brought to us that is uh, crucial is uh, absolutely correct. Materiality matrix, <laughs> this exercise was in the past a picture, right? We use, I remember when I did my sustainability master degree 10 years ago, it was like we did this and then after a while we would come back to check and yes, one year later, we would do brief the different scenario. Then uh, this is where uh, the transformation requires tools, like what Terence presented to us. And I must say, I love this tool. Then back to Carolina point is about, okay, how about smaller companies, right? How can we, Bayer works a lot with our suppliers, because we understand that we are responsible for these small and medium companies. Then we need to go with them, right? Otherwise, there is no way that we can be better as a society. Is uh, more important than ever. Then we have been working a lot. Then uh, sustainability nowadays in Bayer is no longer one team here sitting there. In, we have in the procurement, we have across the, our entire company uh, people focusing on sustainability because uh, our chief sustainability officer is our CEO. Then uh, we all have our glasses can discuss sustainability impact or opportunity with our suppliers, with our growers, with our neighbors, and with nonprofits, etc. Then this is an interactive process. Then I'm always trying to see uh, how can we better uh, advance it's only with it people that think and see different than bear a lot this conversation with our suppliers, with everyone that's around us. And more than that, in fact, one of the filters that we have when we are uh, we are asking new 
new solutions from our suppliers is in fact our the ESG. Then this is also a component and we help of course our suppliers to understand how this needs to be done. Um yes that that's very interesting because um you were speaking about um engagement and um, engagement and uh of course it uh, it goes through a need for collaboration not only uh outside of the company but also inside the company uh between partners and uh and pairs inside the company in order to everybody to be on the same path so I, I would like you to speak a little bit about um, how to skip from the picture to a live video of materiality, because it's clear that we cannot be attached to a picture we made 10 years ago, of course, or even two years ago, as there is uh, spoke about. <clears throat> so we need to be dealing with things that are happening. We need to be changing uh, our perception and our strategies inside the company. And this is not only about ESG, of course, but ESG is our uh, topic today. Uh, so how in Brazil, uh, when we talk about um, uh, network, it always comes the, the challenge we have. Of course, it's not only Brazilian situation, but in Brazil, it, it is real. We have like a collaborative crisis we need to deal with. People don't uh, naturally uh, relate with other organizations or, or even inside the organization. Sometimes it's hard to get through the colleagues, the pairs, to put everybody together on the same boat, uh, especially when it comes to uh, sustainability or even ESG that is more uh, economic related, financial related, but there is. Um, there is a matter of trust that we need to talk about. So if you could speak a little about, about co uh, confidence, trust, to call how to collaborate, uh, how we can uh, oversee this challenge, how we can leave it behind a little bit um, in order to go faster. Gabriela, if you could uh, start. Yeah, that's a very interesting and crucial point, Carolina, trust. Right, the, we have been working very hard uh, to ensure we can uh, build trust internally and externally. Then uh, how can you uh, work on it? Uh, it takes a lot. Then it takes, first of all, it takes transparency, right? Then what we have been uh, doing internally is ensuring we all can work with uh, the same mind vision is ensuring you have the same vision. Then if I have, if you are my colleague and we both need to deliver the same vision, then this helps uh, our collaboration remember that uh, if we remember that we needed to deliver on this, then sustainability need to be a common ground, need to be a goal for the entire company connected to the business. Otherwise, this goes to your point that I want to deliver what uh, is in my specific area of action and you will be having a different point. Then uh, the connection, what connect all of us inside one company or inside the society uh, for that matter is in fact, how can we ensure everyone will be there, will have uh, food for all, health for all, and our kids, like Terence also mentioned, will have the right to have it too. Then there is uh, two points here. One is the knowledge, right? We need to ensure people understand that uh, this is serious. We are talking about survival of our, each one of us, of our companies, and there is no way that we can uh, go ahead like we have been. We need to reduce CO2 emission. This is connected to each one of us and the transparency needs to be uh, base of everything that we do. Then back to your question, how we collaborate better is ensuring we share a common ground, first of all, um, the same vision, the purpose, and I believe this was part of the 
the guide to you need to have a purpose after that you need to ensure you have clear or, or what i say transparency clear steps then there is no more uh, um, if there was someday but we cannot have a hide agenda then uh, it's very important to very to be very clear this is why all the companies are now integrated fully at least bear is on it very serious because this needs to be the same agenda. It cannot be one is my business, another one is my sustainability. No, it's how integrated and need to be because otherwise we will not deliver. Then if the colleagues is the same, we need if the company doesn't have the same vision for all, it will be hard to collaborate. But having the same vision and the understanding that we all are measured by collaborating and delivering on sustainability and business together because the business need to deliver on sustainability, then we can uh, collaborate better. Then I would say, yes, generally speaking, is uh, common ground on purpose, transparency on the agenda, and uh, share next steps reporting or sharing with uh, inside the companies how are the goals of everyone. We at Bayer, we have the vision of the goals for everyone. Then the strategy is fully connected. Thank you, Carolina. Good point. <laughs> yeah, good. And uh, yes, it cannot be hidden. And so, Terence, what would you say about that? Well, I love Gabriela's views. I wish I was as optimistic. So I, I find in this current period, humans have almost never been more divided than together. So we have black, white, uh, Democrat, Republican. We have poor, rich. We have the South, we have the North. Um, we have pro-Amazon rainforest and we have pro-logging. We have so we are so divided as a human species, not, not just plan at a planetary level, but even at an Amazonian or a Rio level about what to do for particular issues. I almost find that it's becoming very difficult to pull people together and find common ground. But I think what the human species is particularly good at doing is realizing, maybe a little late, that we have a massive problem and that will be the catalyst to bring people together. So, so I think about, um, uh, uh, I share Gabriel's perspective, when, when you have collaboration, it's, it's a very positive thing. We actually came up with a model once and we called it the shared value model. I have two mountains. Mount Exxon Mobil, I'm an oil uh, uh, driller, and I have Greenpeace. At a visionary level, we were never aligned. Our visions will differ. I'm an oil company, I exist to maximize profits from hydro capture. I'm Greenpeace, I exist to save the planet. Never will we be able to talk. But as we go down the mountain, we start to see that the mountains start to overlap, and that uh, as an oil company, I want to minimize oil pollution because it affects my share price. Greenpeace, also tick, has that same goal. And as you go lower down at a tactical level, there are many opportunities to collaborate and share value, even if you don't need to agree at the top level. You were speaking about tactical level, and there's a question of the audience, uh, uh, actually the first one that uh, we uh, we received just be, uh, just after Terence's uh, speech. Um, let me just check here the name of the uh, person. Just a second, people. It's here. Okay. So Gabriel Pinto is asking, what does government need to do, or what the what do we have to change in legislation? in order that ESG be, uh, oh my God, what's the word in English? Incentivado, to be um, scaled up in Brazil. And I, I will uh, change a little bit of the question because uh, when Terence was showing the, the graphic, um, the graphic situation where we find the connections, there were a lot, of course, of government um, showing there. Of course, government is one of the uh, stakeholders we need to deal with all the time. 
And so I will I would change a little bit of the question, not what we have to do or if we have to do something, but uh, what was your experience until now, Gabriela and Terence, on this relation between organ, uh, private or uh, market organizations and the government um, in, in order to reach out to um, a, a better uh, pathway to achieve ESG goals? So I don't know, maybe Terence first, because the question came after his. Uh, I'm sorry, Terence. Uh, <laughs> some no right. some, hard, was, some was, hard questions will have to show up. <laughs> I was hoping Gabriella would take that question. <laughs> Again, if you, if you look at forces, um, politicians, governments respond to force. Um, that's what gets them moving. And one force might be, I will not be electable in the next election unless I respond to that force over there. So uh, companies also uh, react similarly, as do stock exchanges, as do investor money. So I, I would view it more as a system of forces. The initial drive behind this might have been a combination of government plus investors, but lately over the last three years, it's been heavily driven by investor money. So if you look at companies today, the number one reason they might be very very focused on esg is because if they're not they're no longer investable they won't raise any money no one will give them anything and the cost of their money will become very very expensive now um, thank goodness that another strong driver is is the ceo bayer looking at the passion of gabriella and also the passion of everyone else that wants to work for a company that they believe is doing the right thing. So that becomes an extraordinary push on the CEO. Likewise, on the government, they, they might look at the uh, investability of their country as a whole. And we find that countries with a, a more focus on ESG and better regulation actually get more um, foreign direct investment. So there's a lot of forces, but I would take that difficult question Go back and just think through the notion of force. Uh, Gabriela, what's your thoughts? Yes, thank you. Uh, I I agree. This is a big challenge <laughs> than government. Uh, we had I have a, one small example. We we have been doing a lot of stakeholder engagement in the food systems using uh, what's called is a two food system summit dialogues. This was uh, prepared by United Nations. We we upload the report. It's very transparent. We invite everyone. Everyone, academia, nonprofits, uh, everyone that you name it, everyone has been standing up and uh, doing it with us. Let's think about action. It's very actionable, this kind of thing. Government has been very, very challenged. Uh, then we have been able a little bit when we put together some uh, representations of governments, right? Then this is where then the World Economic Forum, they work with governments. The government directly is a challenge because many times they are afraid, right? It, it can be perceived as they are connecting with companies. Then the, uh, the way we need to overcome this is really put together how oh, it doesn't matter, right? And uh, uh, let me step back a little bit because there is mention of one very important point that we need to act on. That's the black and white world that we are facing now, right? And then uh, these are that. These are is or is no longer end, right? It's, these are that, that or that, etc. Families being divided everywhere, here in the United States, in Brazil, everywhere. That we need to overcome this. And uh, in my opinion, only sustainability people, people that are here in this call, this is up to us. There is no one else that can do it. It's us. Why? Because we know that if we go in this or that, it's the end. It will be the end. I have kids, and many of you have, and those that don't have, have nephews or nieces. We need to believe, and uh, Terence also mentioned that I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because otherwise I couldn't stand up each day. And I wake up like 5 a.m. because I believe there is a lot to be done. 
And I really, I believe it's on us. There is no salvation. It was in the past, I believe we were like, oh, the government will solve this. The CEO will solve this. Finish. <laughs> there is no this leader out there that will solve everything. It's up to us. Then it's each action. Then if our government is not doing what would be necessary, and I believe this is the case, we need to stand up and we need to act. We need to include and we cannot lose the hope. But then we, as a company, we have big power. We can convene many together. If one specific can feel like uh, push it, then let's convene more. Let's find a solution to bring out to this table and say, this is the planet that we have. There is no other out there. And we need to find a solution then. In my opinion, my personal opinion, carbon pricing is one thing that we absolutely need to incorporate. We need to work on this. Uh, companies can help, can, and we are. In our case, Bayer, we have projects in Brazil, in United States, and we are on it. But we need more. We need the rest of the market. We need others uh, uh, um, being with us. Then let's make it happen. Then answer the question that was made about the government. Yes, governments can help, need to help. And it's up to us to call on them and let them know that doesn't matter who we win, we need the government on it. There is a conference of climate just after Brazilian election. We need Brazil leadership there in COP27. There is no way to be out. Doesn't matter who we win. This is absolutely then one thing that the bands do a lot, and I know Fijian also working on it, is platforms. We need to work, okay, what we need from governors, doesn't matter who. Let's work on platforms and uh, deliver this to all the candidates and say what we want. And it's up to each one of us. Yes, and, and stakeholder engagement has everything to do with agenda setting. So it's about influence. We are influence other, influencing others and others are influencing us. So yes, that's, that's a good Good reflection. Thank you very much. I would like to to pick. We have seven more minutes. So, and I have two questions. One is very uh, generic, and the other is uh, focused, but very philosophical. I would like to bring here for the discussion. Um, but I would like to uh, you to speak a little about a little bit about greenwashing because it always comes the term. Uh, there's always this fear of being taken. Uh, by our um, consumers as greenwashers. And uh, ESG brought again this debate. So um, it's still challenging to create a consistent narrative of value creation uh, with ESG strategies. And what would be one of two recommendations you would give to avoid this greenwash zone? And I, I have read a few days ago, a very interesting uh, article by Joel McWower, that is the leader of Greenpeace platform, and he was speaking uh, about ESG and he was asking himself and the audience uh, how much leeway is there for companies that commit to sustainability goals to be less than perfect without being called out as greenwashers, because we won't be perfect. So how to deal with that? So uh, maybe Gabriela yeah, first this time. Start, is, uh, I should be start. Yes. Uh, uh, very important point. Then uh, let me step back again. We talked about trust before. Then and we can only have the trust if we are transparent, right? So if uh, if we are sharing everything, then data data is crucial. Uh, then this is why each time we are saying, okay, we have those goals, but we are being we are being audited by the Lord related to all the goals. And if you Google, you all can Google everything that I mentioned is out there in the internet, audited by the Lord. Then how to avoid greenwash? Only that <laughs> and that transparency. It's uh, is what uh, can help us to gain the trust. And it takes it's each step, right? Uh, trust, uh, how they say, they have a say, right? That trust takes your life, and but you can destroy it very quickly. Then uh, it's, 
uh, let me reframe again. Uh, in, in order to ensure there is no greenwash, you need to have a clear, transparent uh, goal, what the company is doing. In my opinion, the connection with the business need to go through uh, the compensation. If not, it may be a challenge for the company to advance. Then uh, we are still in a um, market, capitalist market, then the compensation is crucial. And the data to show what's not directly related to the compensation, then how are we performing? Then tools like those that Terence has are crucial because we need that then it's no longer what it used to be when I started. That was like Gabriella connecting and having a consul and calling others. We need to ensure everyone has access and everyone understand how Bayer is doing all the relations. Then the, we have the principles, but how are we performing? Then all this information needs to be out there, then sustainability reports following out the guidelines are crucial. And we need to ensure, of course, there is a better alignment between all the guidance because the companies like ours, we are trying to do, we are following everything, but like Terry said, there is a lot. But yes, in a nutshell, it's transparency, data and compensation. Now let's hear Terry. <laughs> that has everything to do with trust we were talking about before. I think Gabriel is right. I, I wouldn't have chosen that starting point, but now I listen to Gabriel's logic. I would. So thank you for starting. It's trust. So if if for fear of being accused of a greenwashing, I don't aim very high, I set low goals. We're all in big trouble. So we should be setting huge goals and then transparently communicating. Well, we missed this goal, sorry, but we learned this, and next year we'll do better. Uh, one of, one of the, the big things I just published on LinkedIn on that some time ago, a cartoon about net zero. And uh, the second, the only other thing I would add to what Gabriel has said is to avoid fads. Net zero. Net zero without carbon accounting is greenwashing. Completely. Because the CEO will come out with some big announcement, oh, we're going to be net zero by 2030. He's not going to be there at 2030. He doesn't care. If he is going to be there, then they're going to say, well, net zero by 2040. No one will remember that promise in 2040. So there will be no consequences to having lied, to having greenwashed. But it all goes back to this notion of trust. Can you trust the transparency of of that company and and ultimately people are uh, rather uh, they don't trust anymore trust has declined over multiple years trust in government institutions and in corporations and many things in each other and so we need to prove it but trust comes back to trust thank you for pointing that out Yes, okay, so we have one minute left and uh, we unfortunately have to um, end. But I have one question from Paula Lima from the audience that is very emblematic. And uh, you, you, Terence, uh, talked about uh, sm low goals, small goals. How do small goals relate to a big, a huge challenge? And Paula is asking, uh, how, for example, a small uh, project with a vegetable garden inside the school can impact carbon questions, uh, climate change questions. So I would um, pick this very, very um, emblematic question and ask you to do your final words uh, answering and also connecting to your final words of how can a small project, a single project, uh, be impactful, be uh, meaningful for these huge questions we have to resolve all together inside our businesses and our families. So uh, maybe Terry's first and then Gabriela locks. Well, I, all I would say is that, that that little vegetable patch is probably giant for the children who are working in it. It's probably a brand new initiative for the school. In fact, that person is modest. It's fantastic what they're doing. 
that will change people's relationships to the soil, to the notion of what grows, what they eat. It's an amazing project. It's not small. Yeah. So well done. <laughs> and, and, and it takes many of these little projects which will lead us hopefully to, and I'm optimistic like Gabriella, to find some way to avert this impending um, crisis that we're, we're even now facing. Uh, Gabriella. Yeah, I agree with you, walk the talk, right? Uh, it takes each action. Then uh, in my house, uh, we do everything, in my community, in my company, we do everything that we can. And the one final point is everyone that's connected now. It, it started at 10 a.m. in Brazil. Uh, here in the United States was 8 a.m. In Singapore, it was 8 p.m.-ish. Uh, then each one made the time to be here. Or if you are going to be listening this later, you are making the time because you believe something can be done. And because you believe in your power. Then what we need to remember always is each step that we uh, we make, each action, it's impacting. Doesn't matter how. Then we need to be to have it, to be careful because we are impacting always. Then my footprint, my actions impact my kids, my neighbors, and we need to have the the conscience. We need to know that it's a huge responsibility to live in this planet in 2022. Huge responsibility. There is a lot of people that are like me, but if they are born in Ukraine, they are facing a big challenge today. Then what I'm doing with everything, with my garden, with my neighbors, with my kids, with my bike, making some choice, with each choice we are impacting, then it's a huge power. It's challenge. We can we have a choice to make. That's like oh my god, all those challenges, right? What can I do? Or oh my god, I can do a lot because I will be part of this revolution that I believe it's happening, and I believe people that are here are part of this, of the change that we know need to happen. Then I appreciate a lot the opportunity. I appreciate the tools that Terence and his team are building. I appreciate the work that Fusion is doing. I appreciate the work that Brazil is doing, making sure we produce and we conserve at the same time. And I appreciate also the opportunity to think about what else can we do. Let's, uh, I want to make sure when I finish my life here in this planet, there is this saying there, she did everything that she could. <laughs> then I would be like, check, and I can go. Uh, thank you so much again for everyone. And yes, the garden is very important, and each action is crucial. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Gabriela and Terence. Terence, I will change to Portuguese to finish our session. So, for you to understand. Pessoal, muito obrigada. Eu estou absolutamente honrada. Very much. Uh, it was an honor to have conducted this debate. It was very enlightening. It was very provocative. The tools are fantastic. The challenge is enormous. And many large activities are important, activities of large corporations and uh, initiatives of industry to internalize this all of this in their strategy. With the help of tools to filter uh, our paths, uh, I think that's very important because we have an enormous quantity of information circulating. So we really need to have focus. There's no way other way around it. And at the same time, this focus needs to be dynamic as has been said here. And again, small activities matter. So this set of lessons that we, take from this talk basically will impact every single one of us as leaders or as professionals within our institutions or even as activists within NGOs where we work. So for sure this talk served as fuel for us to keep moving ahead. So thank you very much for those of you who like to keep accompanying the work of TSC or BEAR or FIJA. Again, the social media channels of all of these institutions have a lot of information. 
our set list on YouTube also has a lot of content about ESG, about sustainability, about important issues for humanity, especially uh, information on the aquarium list uh, for uh, Fija. So keep following us and thank you everyone. Have a good evening, Terrence. Have a great day, Daniela, and have a great day, uh, everyone who is watching us either live or later today. So thank you, it was a pleasure.